into a riot. This is one of the few riots where like first responders are totally cool with it. Um, thank, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, how many folks, I'm just curious, we've got a really nice uh, audience tonight. How many folks is the first time that you have participated in any kind of riot event gathering and so on? Number of hands. Well, thank you very much for coming out. We're, we're happy to have you. Um, the preponderance of hands were down, so that means a lot of folks uh, know about us before, but since we do have some newcomers in the room, I'll tell you a little bit uh, about ourselves uh, and then we'll get started. Um, my name is Tom Snyder. Uh, I founded this little organization along with a couple other folks um, 10 years ago. Um, we're, and, and in fact, I'll make, I'll do my plug at the very beginning of the event, still in. Our plug is March 19th, if you want to come out for a much bigger party than this one this evening, um, we're going to have a 10 year anniversary party in the same location. Um, that event, I think, is on our website, or if it's not, it will be very, very soon. And we would love to have everybody out uh, to talk about kind of the last 10 years of collaboration and partnership and kind of working together in what started once upon a time as the Raleigh Internet of Things Meetup Group. Uh, for folks that remember Meetup, we actually still use Meetup a little bit, even though uh, I don't think that many people go to that platform anymore to, uh, to sign up for events. But since then, we've grown into an organization that operates primarily in North Carolina and Virginia, but, but has some activities in other spaces uh, around the country, and, and we travel around the world promoting technology-driven economic development and job creation. Through our efforts, uh, we're really excited to have been able to run startup accelerator programs. We're operating those now in four cities in, in North Carolina and Virginia. We run large uh, convening groups, you know, a thousand plus style meetups in Atlanta, in Charlotte, in Denver, in Washington, D.C., a number of other places around the country, bringing people together just like uh, you are this evening to, to really talk about the fundamental driver of our economy, which is, which is technology. And that's not a U.S. thing, that's not a North Carolina thing, that's just like a fundamental humanity thing. Like, when iron came along, we stopped using bronze, right? Or at least for a lot of other applications. And, you know, when currency came along, we stopped trading goats and sheep. You know, as technologies emerge, no matter what they are, it really drives the economy. And right now, the big shift that's happening, uh, and those that have been out the ladies events before have heard me say this, many times but we are in this fundamental shift from an information age you know the internet being the kind of the leading core backbone technology driving the uh, you know the way that we live our lives the way that we do business the way that we engage and interact with each other to being a data economy and what i mean by that is no longer just like storing and archiving information in databases that can be web crawled and can be searched and so on and so forth, but collecting data and in real time analyzing what does that data mean and what do I do with it? How do I use that data, whether it's from an IoT sensor, whether it's from a microphone, whether it's from a camera, whether it's from a keyboard or a touch screen as we as humans are interacting with our devices, how do we use that to automate our healthcare, automate transportation, automate our energy grid, automate our agricultural systems, our supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really where, where, where we're at from a technology point of view. So our organization is deeply involved in this. We're a nonprofit. Our belief is the best jobs are these emerging technology jobs. So what can we do to help people to either find those jobs or in more cases, create those jobs through entrepreneurship. Um, so that's a little bit of background about us. This evening is an annual event we've been doing since 2018 that we call the State of the Region. Uh, some years I've actually dressed up like the president and we've come out and we've had flags and we've, uh, we decided this year we'd do a little bit lower key. But, but the idea is to think about the places where we're living. So when I talk about region, I'm going to talk some about like local region. Let's talk about the triangle set, but also a little bit broader region. We're going to talk about North Carolina. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Virginia as well because we do a lot of work there, and I want to draw some comparisons between the two states. But uh, I'll try and take some of the same themes 
like you would hear in a traditional state arrangement. So I'm going to talk a little bit about you know, jobs and business and kind of the broad economy. I want to talk uh, some about research, development, education. I'll talk a little bit about you know what does competition looks like. You know what's our not our national defense but our regional defense. What does funding look like? So I'm going to co cover a few different topics, and then when I'm done, I, I do want to open to some Q and A. I can't promise that I'm an expert on everything. I'm actually probably not really an expert on anything except I'm just good at standing up with a microphone and uh, talking like I'm an expert, but. Uh, there are some people in the room that uh, are going to challenge me later, but that's that's a good thing, right? We want that kind of a healthy dialogue. Um, for those later, if you ask some questions, we got some T-shirts. It's a good way to win a shirt uh, if that helps you to uh, to engage. Um, but first, I just want to thank you for for being here. Uh, I also want to thank the Raleigh founded team, uh, Lauren Romer and Isabella, and others are here. I see Jordan. Um, this is a fantastic space. We have been partnered with Raleigh Founded now uh, throughout our 10 years in several locations. We were actually in this building back in 2018 um, when we launched our very first cohort of our accelerator. And, um, and we're back in this building. We've been in a couple of the Raleigh Founded locations in Europe. Uh, they are, in my estimation, the premier co-working facility uh, across the triangle. They are getting ready next month, I believe, to open Carry Founded. So uh, I'm sure there are ways to go check that out. Um, this is a great place, whether you're a startup, to have your business where you can network, where you can meet other folks, where you are facilitating kind of the serendipity of accidental coll collisions and connections that, that, that come by working in an entrepreneurial space. But it's also a place where we see some of the biggest companies in the triangle uh, where folks are working from home and say, you know what, I need to get out of my house once in a while and, ne and network and be, be a part of something. Uh, so there's a way for, for them to work here. Uh, the, you know, we have investors that come through, there's experts that come through and give talks, there's folks like me that, uh, you know, fill, fill the air for a few minutes here and there. But I, I really encourage you, whatever community you're in, to, to look for facilities like Raleigh County and, and to engage. Uh, we also have a number of our sponsor organizations here. If you are a corporate sponsor, university sponsor, municipal sponsor of Riot, will you please raise your hand? These folks have enabled us over the years to make every program that we do, every event that we do, every support that we give to startup companies uh, has remained 100% free. It's really important if you're going to include everyone in this technology economy, this data economy, that everyone participate. Not everybody has that ability to participate. And so keeping things free uh, is, you know, we're grateful to the sponsors that have supported us financially, but more importantly, support us with their time, with their expertise, with their mentorship. It's also important, uh, I live, you know, about six blocks that direction. I love downtown Raleigh, I can walk here to work. But we also recognize there's entrepreneurship in a lot of other communities. And so we've opened offices in rural locations like Stafford County, Virginia, like Wilson, North Carolina, trying to go to where entrepreneurs in other places are. And that is also because of uh, strong local government partnerships, but then also the, the corporate sponsorship. The long tail of entrepreneurship in our rural communities, uh, it's massive. You know, when, when you take in aggregate all of the potential rural customers, with the ur urban customers, you know, it's like, why aren't we going for both? And so if you're in a big technology company and you haven't thought about sponsoring organizations that are activating those smaller communities, uh, I encourage you to think about that. Um, so to get back on topic, where are we? We are in, I think, an interesting point right now. We are finally to a point where I'm going to meetings and meeting with folks and no longer prefacing the start of that meeting with some comment about the pandemic and you know, it's like, oh yeah, I remember when people used to come out to events or not, you know, think, things are, have achieved what we'll call the new normal, which, which I think is a good thing. When you look at job creation and company formation, for the third straight year, we are at or near a record-breaking record state in North Carolina of new business registrations about 6.2% higher than last year, according to Secretary of State data. Um, a little bit behind the national average, but very, very, very close. 
Uh, we're actually significantly ahead. If you look at just our neighboring states, uh, Tennessee is actually a little bit of, ahead at about just over 8 percent. Virginia, not doing as well, just about 2.1 percent higher than they have been in previous years. South Carolina is actually in the negative. There, there's lower registrations than they had, had the year before. So North Carolina is doing pretty well in business registrations. But what's more important to us is actually jobs. It's great to have businesses that register. But what, what do we look at in terms of job creation? Um, Light, uh, Lightbook tracks these kinds of, uh, of statistics. And last year, we were number 10 in the nation in employment, employment growth on a per capita basis. Uh, this year, we've actually advanced to number eight. Uh, I haven't been able to, to track down the exact number of jobs yet, but last year that, ten, that number 10 ranking translated to 812,000 new jobs in North Carolina. And so this year is somewhere certainly in that kind of a ballpark. Those jobs are being fueled by you know, a strong community uh, college system, a strong university system, other folks that are kind of generating a new talent pipeline, but an awful lot of it is in migration. So if you look at just population growth state by state, as you might expect, the states, the, you know, the top 10 states in the country that are growing in population are also capturing the most new jobs. Uh, that's maybe not that surprising. Um, what is interesting is that the, those 10 states you know, just 20% of the states in our country are capturing more than 50% of the new jobs across the entire country. So in migration has been really, really healthy for our state. Uh, generally speaking, growth is good, right? If your business is growing, it's probably healthy. If, you know, there's lots of things where you can say, you know, if you're growing, uh, you're, you're probably doing well. Um, why is it that we have been ranked you know, number one in many different metrics. CNBC is maybe the one that gets talked about the most. We're the number one state to do business, according to CNBC. Uh, it happens Virginia is number two, so I'm going to talk about Virginia a little bit as a close competitor or perhaps close collaborator. Um, I'll offer my perspective on, on, on why that is, and there's some things that I think are good about this, and there's some things that I think are good about this, but only for a little while. Um, so one of the reasons that we rank really, really highly is that these types of rankings tend to put a lot of weight on the tax landscape, state by state and community by community. And North Carolina is one of the most business friendly states from a tax point of view. Uh, our corporate tax rate is two and a half percent, it's already the fifth lowest in the whole country. And there's legislation that passed uh, a few years back that indexes the corporate tax rate down to zero by 2030, assuming the state continues to hit certain growth metrics that it looks like they're gonna be pretty easy to hit. So business loves that, right? How many people like paying taxes? <laughs> Not that many good. You should like it, it's actually a good thing. Um, so that, so that, that's a piece of it. Income tax is also coming down. So personal, personal income tax in the state is good. That's part of why people wanna move here. Um, that's good in the short term, as long as you have dramatic growth. You can afford low tax rates because you make it up on volume. It's like, being, like running a low margin business. You can run really, really low cost business if you have massive volumes. As soon as your volumes start to decline and you're just barely breaking even and you suddenly need to make new infrastructure investments or do things like maintenance and repair and stuff, you can be in trouble. So long term, I'm a little bit worried. Another part of the reason that North Carolina ranks really, really highly is that the, the strategy at a state level for economic development policy has really been focused on uh, what we'll call big game hunting. Right? We remember a few years ago the, the crazy media attention to our efforts to get the Amazon HQ2. Right, we lost that to Arlington, Virginia, and maybe a little bit to New York. We're not really sure what Amazon's really doing there, but um, but yeah, we weren't going to be left out, so we went and gave a crazy deal to Apple. Right, and we have had numerous big projects that are incongruent with this tax policy. 
Well, business loves it, right? They're going to get tax breaks in all the early years while they fulfill the higher uh, requirements, the investment requirements, et cetera, et cetera, to then at the time that they're going to start paying that back, there's not going to be any taxes to pay. So this is really a losing strategy uh, for our state. Um, I've got a number of companies that I want to, um, to name here and ask if anyone can guess what these companies have in, in, in common. So Sonic Automotive, s and Coffee, Conduit, Centene, Advanced Auto, Bandwidth, Allstate, Microsoft. Any idea what those companies have in common? Received more than they paid. Four hundred and thirty-two million dollars in tax incentives combined for promises that were not fulfilled. So every single one of those companies had to renege on promises. Now there's clawbacks, right? The state, in theory, gets that money back. But there was a massive opportunity cost for that kind of economic development policy, and that's not an exhaustive list, right? That's just a, a few that come in a quick in a quick search. Um, I'm not entirely against the idea of big companies. You know, many big companies are our corporate sponsors that are enabling us to do what we do, right? But the Small Business Administration has recognized for many, many, many years that at the lowest point, about 64% of all jobs are created by small businesses. Of, of all kind of new job, most of the economic health and vitality is in the small business sector, and yet even like at a municipal level, when you look at economic development strategy, it's spending a lot of money on site development. It's spending money to bring utilities to a spot to try and you know, attract a large employer, maybe manufacturer. North Carolina is fantastic at doing this. So let me give a few examples here. Um, got another list here. So. Just in the last couple of years, right? VinFast, two billion dollars invested for auto manufacturing. Obviously, these are some of the folks that have gotten tax incentives. We'll see if they can follow through on those or not, right? Boom Supersonic, five hundred million. Bosch, one hundred thirty million for power tools. Wolfspeed, five billion for semiconductor manufacturing. Toyota, eight billion dollars plan investment for battery uh, manufacturing for EV vehicles. Dynamic Printing, two hundred thirty million. Uh, also in, in the battery space, uh, Siemens Mobility, 85 million for passenger rail cars. Dymax, 47 million in industrial adhesives. And Albemarle, 180 million in mining materials, advanced mining materials. These are some of the, the big wins that create ribbon cutting moments for elected officials. And if there's one thing that you know, any elected official cares about is the publicity of that, of that kind of win. It's much more difficult to say, hey, look at this startup company that just went from three jobs to seven jobs. Right? That doesn't make a lot of headlines. Um, again, and not, not completely against this, but when you look at the actual budget in North Carolina at a state and legislative level, there's ne nearly zero for entrepreneurial driven economic development. We more or less, the entire state has to rely on our friends like Tom Rue here at NCID who can give out a lot of grants to startups but doesn't have the kind of deep pockets that a state government has, right? So if we want to have more success, that, you know, when you're looking to invest, invest in their organization. We, um, we do see some interesting competition though. So I, I promised to talk about Virginia as the number two state to do business. Virginia also checks a lot of the big business boxes, and they have gotten the second largest um, private investment project in the history of the United States from AWS. AWS is putting $38 billion into data centers in North Virginia. Right? They have Amazon HQ2 going into Arlington. They just let, you know, landed a massive Wells Fargo project out in the western part of the state. They have landed a new Lego factory. Everybody loves talking about Legos, right? You know, so Virginia also does this, this big thing. And their tax rate has been unchanged since 1978. So when you talk about certainty, like uncertainty is what scares business. 
you know, Virginia also has a lot of certainty where business can say, like, I know what I'm getting into, and that's very attractive. But they also, on the government level, have put significant funding into entrepreneurship. And I'm hopeful that you know one day maybe our legislators, our General Assembly, will also look at this. How many folks in the room are involved in some way in a startup or a small business? Right? So you know, write your Congress people. State of Virginia made what I think is a relatively small step, but a pretty significant one. They seeded with about $142 million through a budget appropriation, a group in the government to then hire a nonprofit and to, and to manage them properly through, through board governance and, and, and oversight to, to do four things. To start doing private equity in, you know, style investing in startups. You know, Virginia runs a fund. They invest side by side with venture capitalists. They've invested about $51 million over the past several years that have attracted uh, almost uh, $1.94 billion in private follow-on investment into Virginia-based startups. They also give grants, early stage grants, very similar to what NCI did does here in North Carolina, to, to startup companies. And they give grants up to $200,000 each to startup accelerators and incubators and other support organizations because they recognize that the next wave of the economy are going to be all of you in this room. So that's pretty interesting. And then finally, they run uh, essentially like a CTO office for the state running interesting technology projects and things that, that strategically position the state and the government from leveraging all the kinds of cool tech that, that you all might be doing in, in the enterprise space. So if anyone wants to learn more about that, I'll be happy to talk about it. But, but it's something that I think is really interesting to, to think about. Um, now, I don't think everything's doom and gloom. I've talked a lot about maybe, maybe some negativity towards the, the big business side of the market, but there's a lot of things that I think in North Carolina have us positioned really, really, really well compared to other regions, and also are a part of why we, I think, authentically are a top state to do business. And I think the most important one is our diversity. We're diverse across a lot of different measures of diversity, but the economists will say you know, one of the most important ones is industry diversity. So when we look at, say, Massachusetts, that by the way, on a per capita basis, North Carolina invests about 2.7% of our GDP in research and development. All right, the national average is 2.9% of GDP. So we don't quite invest as much as other places. In North Carolina, it happens that research and development investment is about 75% from the corporate sector and about 25% investment in university research and commercialization and things like that. Things like, you may have heard the, the, the NC Innovate announcement, right? A $500 million two-year project that has been launched in North Carolina that essentially creates a technology transfer office for all the schools in the university system and the HBCUs that don't have their own tech transfer offices. So like, you know, NC State and Carolina and stuff, they've, they've already got it. But the rest of the university system now has a resource to help to commercialize technologies at, at some smaller schools, which is fantastic. But all of that money is only for the universities themselves. That's not like startup support money. Um, so um, it's really just a, a growth in our R&D spending, in our innovation, in our support to universities where North Carolina ranks very high. Uh, but Massachusetts, back to what I was talking about, Massachusetts, California, and Washington are the top three in the nation in R&D expenditures on a per capita basis. They, those three states invest between 5.5 and 6.2% of their GDP in R&D. But where we're unique is if you look at Massachusetts, it's fairly dominated by medical and robotics. If you look down in, in Texas, like Houston is a huge hub. That's almost all energy and healthcare technologies. Uh, you look even you know, in Seattle, say, it's dominated primarily by software and cloud. In North Carolina, we have, I believe, the healthiest diversity of industry of any other state. When we look at uh, not just industry sector, where we have really strong life sciences, we have strong um, Biopharmaceutical, we have strong biomanufacturing, which is a huge growth industry. Uh, we have IT, we have 
software, we have you know one of the strongest hubs of computer gaming. You know, you go on and on and on. Um, while at the same time, you know, agriculture still is the number one market in, in the state, and agriculture is very quickly uh, transforming in, in terms of a digital transformation. Uh, agriculture at scale is manufacturing, and there's strong manufacturing roots in this state, and they're being applied now uh, to, to production. And, and we're excited to be involved in a project with the USDA and the city of Wilson and a few other partners uh, out in Wilson, North Carolina to develop out a smart ag test bed. Uh, so if anybody wants to learn more about that, we're happy to talk about that off offline. But um, that, that, that diversity, why is it important? One is that anyone that's ever talked to an investor knows that investors will advise you to take a portfolio approach, right? You don't place all of your investment just into one thing and you hope it goes, right? And so that's an all or nothing proposition. You know, smart investors will say, well, you do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and so on. Um, economies work the same way. Some years one sector is up, another sector is down, so on and so forth. We're very robust in that way. More importantly, in my experience, I've lived here since 1993, 94, and I've witnessed a lot of industry hopping. So folks that spent a number of years working in a medical device company, that then their next job is in local government or somebody that was working in a cloud services company that suddenly now is working in transportation or some totally different industry. Technologies apply horizontally, right? If you really, really understand analytics or you understand IT or system integration or whatever it might be, uh, you know, bringing those skills to another industry and bringing fresh thought and idea makes us really, really powerful as a state. And the amount of in-migration that we have and people coming from different regions of the country from different parts of the world that have different shared experiences come from other industries, that's also really, really healthy. So our diversity, I think, is, is, is our, truly our number one strength. Um, I want to talk about one other kind of mega trend, and then I'll open up to some Q&A, uh, which is on the side of capital. Since there's a lot of startups here in the room, uh, not everybody has perhaps tried to do fundraising. We run a startup accelerator. If you're interested in learning about an accelerator, our focus is on how do you help companies to form a really, really solid business and be revenue driven and grow. Um, fundraising, we, and we've got some investors in the room, so don't take offense at this, but fundraising, in my view, should be your last option. But, it, but when it is an option, and it can be a good option, it needs to be a very strategic option that you and your investors are aligned towards the same goals. Venture capital is not like an ATM where I get a loan and then I just pay it back later. It truly is you know, forming a marriage and, and doing things together and hopefully you both want the same outcomes. Uh, I won't get into too much detail on that. There's a trend in the US that I think is dangerous, um, which is that funds are getting larger and larger and larger. Um, most of the, the media discourse right now in the investment space is that venture capital is way down in 2023 compared to 2022, right? Uh, the, the most recent projection that I saw, David Gardner, if anybody knows co-founders capital, uh, puts out a quarterly newsletter, and he, he had some data from PitchBook that showed they were projecting that 2023, when all the numbers were calculated, was gonna be two-thirds lower total venture investment than 2022, right? That's a massive reduction across the country. Um, so that's a U.S. number, not a North Carolina number, I, I believe. Um, but that's not the, the right conversation, I think. I think that any time that the kind of macroeconomic climate changes, investment thesis changes, right? The calculus of investment is going to say when capital is really, really expensive because interest rates are higher than they have been historically or whatever, well, then maybe we start looking at uh, you know, bonds and securities and safer investments, and when capital is cheap, we take those riskier ventures, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the investment calculus is going to ebb and flow just like the economy does. If you're thinking about fundraising right now and it's hard to get capital, like, don't worry about it. It'll come back at some point. Use this right now as your excuse to say, I need to refocus on revenue. I need to drive revenue to grow my company, delight my customers, and you may find that you can do it without having to take on the venture. However, sometimes you know, you know, we need that. The bigger and bigger and bigger funds, I think, are the bigger challenge. Um, and so I'll talk about that, but then I think North Carolina is actually well positioned based on, on this threat. So, and 
my worry is that the venture community has that behavior. And as funds get bigger, there will be less um, ability for those funds to allow early exits. Small funds can allow a startup to grow to a point and actually have a nice exit that allows those founders and, and, uh, and early employees, frankly, to move out of the world of, you know, what is my income to suddenly being in, in a place of wealth, you know, generational wealth. You know, a million dollars can be profoundly impactful. Certainly think of me, I would love to have that guy, right? Um, but, but, but those founders then circulate much more quickly into starting their next companies, into mentoring other founders, into becoming angel investors to write the really small checks that is the survival money for the next generation. When you start to take the further rounds of funding, particularly from the mega funds, if a fund is, the limited partners in the fund are expecting to get five, seven, 10 X return, right? And you're suddenly running a $500 million fund. Well, there's only a very, very small number of companies that can cover all the other companies that aren't gonna make it, right? And it, it, and it becomes like a unicorn or bust mentality. And it's not really the fault of the funds themselves, it's the mechanics of kind of the math and how, our, how it works out. But it forces this behavior to not allow companies to exit when it can be really, really beneficial for those companies and the founders themselves because it doesn't necessarily deliver back to the LPs. And so that's something that I think is concerning and it's a, it's a national trend. Last year, when you look at small funds, the ones that are writing like the pre-seed and seed kinds of checks, they raised half the money that they had raised in the previous year. Now some of that might be that macroeconomic condition, right? Interest rates are higher, maybe you know, wealthy individuals aren't putting money in as limited partners or doing other kinds of things, right? I think there's some of that. But the fact is, the large funds did not slow down. In fact, they accelerated in growing. So, so the money is still, you know, all filtering up towards the top. Um, so, so I'm not sure that I agree that with, with the, the kind of bluster that, well, I didn't invest in this thing because I'm worried about, you know, a few, uh, a, a few tenths of a percent on, on interest rates or whatever the case might be. Um, here in North Carolina, particularly in this research triangle region, we are seeing dramatic increase in participation in those small checks, which is really, really healthy. So we're bucking the trend, which is really good for our region. And, and it's coming from entrepreneurs that they get it, I think, that are saying, we need to go and we need to make sure this is going, right? Scott Wago, many of you may know, started the Triangle Tweeter Fund. It's an index fund. It basically, it's almost like an ATM for a startup. You know, I can't promise that everybody's gonna get invested, but, but his theory is write a whole lot of small checks. In just two years, the Twitter Fund, I believe, has issued 68 deals with something like 52, 53 companies. It's about three and a half million dollars total invested. So, you know, three and a half million, that's, it's a nice piece of money, but across those many deals, that works out, it's about $51,000 per check on average, right? That's placing a ton of bets on, on survival. And if each of those companies are going from the, you know, the two jobs to the seven jobs, like that's significant growth in aggregate. This is the same kind of total amount of job creation that our elected officials might give a $100 million tax credit to, to one company to try and create those, those kind of jobs, who, by the way, has a high probability of not fulfilling that requirement and a few years later saying, sorry, we, we couldn't do it. Um, so, so small check writing, you, you see it with Jurassic Capital, you see it with Primordial, we see a number of funds in the area that are writing these, you know, these first checks into businesses. That's really, really, really good for, for our, our economy. And then we have some of the more established funds, you know, the whole cities of the world, co-founders, et cetera, that are onto their successive funds, they're getting bigger and bigger. But for the companies where that makes sense, uh, that capital is also available, and you don't necessarily have to go to, to London or San Francisco or Beijing or somewhere to get that money. You might be able to get that right here. So, um, so I think that if I look at like overall, what's the state of our region? I think that we're in a really good place. We have this really, really strong 
industry diversity, we have strong cultural diversity, we have people from all over, very, very, you know, a lot of different backgrounds, and we have a really, really collaborative um, just culture, which is great. When I've spent time out in Silicon Valley, you don't see this, right? You folks won't talk to each other. I'm in Washington, D.C., a lot of defense sector kind of stuff. You can't get people even to say who their employer is, I think. Everybody thinks they're on top secret projects, I guess. I but here, like, folks really are, are collaborative. It's a good, it's a good thing. Um, we've got more and more early stage capital coming in. That, you know, that's a good thing. We have in the short term these really, really favorable tax policies. So you take advantage of why, why you can. I don't know that that's great long term, but great, great, great companies and healthy companies. And if North Carolina made bad moves, Maybe people move other places later, I don't know. Not encouraging that now, but hopefully we can get those policies changed uh, sometime in the future. Um, I think when we look at you know, the, the downside, it really is that state level strategy and leadership that, that is lacking. The good news is mo almost every state around the country isn't any different than North Carolina in that, in that regard. But when you look at number two in the rankings, one state from the north of us, uh, they, they have a huge head start. I, I think the great opportunity is the folks in Virginia are extremely collaborative as well, and I think very willing to, to educate, to work with us, to say, in the data economy, the reason we started Riot was we really believe that in the way that once upon a time, Silicon Valley was seen globally as a center of excellence for this internet economy, we can be the center of excellence for the data economy. It requires entrepreneurs like you to take those chances, to build those companies, to help each other out, to work together, uh, it takes some other kind of macroeconomic things that we'll continue to work on together. But I think that that center of excellence, or, you know, there's no business that you know, working collaboratively with another state from the north, for example, could be, could be a good thing. In the short term, what we all can do is work really collaboratively with various neighbors around the state. There's, a, 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 I'll give one last plug for some really, really cool stuff that have me published on North Carolina, which is that when you think about seed funding for entire industries, generally that comes from the federal government. And our federal government has recognized, I believe, that we have these strengths that I've talked about. And if you look at three major programs that have been launched recently, one was called Build Back Better, another one is a, a big chunk of the CHIPS Act money, which is semi metric money, that's being administered by the Department of Defense. And if you look at the National Science Foundation, they've been running a program called Engines. So these are all like really, really massive block grant programs. There have been 38 awards given across those three programs in the last 12 or 15 months, something like that. North Carolina has won four out of those 38. That's 10 and a half percent of all the awards nationally. Like a lot of states haven't gotten any. Um, Maybe, I was talking to somebody earlier who said, well, maybe that's because we're a swing state and uh, so the Republicans are trying to be nice to us. I, what, if so, that's okay, I'll take the money, right? But, but the fact is, you know, we, we won two out of the 10 NSF engines programs, both in Central North Carolina. These are each $160 million projects to see new industries. One is in regenerative medicine. The whole idea of, I can keep drinking this beer because eventually they'll 3D print me a new liver. Uh, really, really, really cool, cool science. And, and not a bad application, I guess. Um, but, but then the, uh, the other is in, in advanced uh, textiles. And so that, you know, that's really, really cool stuff. The DOD project on the CHIPS Act uh, was interesting. It, it's $38.9 million for wide band gap semiconductors. The, these are materials that are going to be instrumental in uh, creating a solid state energy grid and power electronics. They're instrumental in advanced laser technologies and in advanced radio frequency communication stuff. So very, very diverse set of materials that are, are leading you know, three important uh, new industry sectors. Uh, and then the Build Back Better project, the NC Biotech Center right here in the Triangle uh, won that project. Uh, that one I believe is 25 million in developing out capabilities and workforce for biopharmaceutical manufacturing. Uh, and many folks know that Holly Springs has the single largest flu vaccine manufacturing facility in the entire world. 
right? Vaccine there, I love it. We kind of hand them. So, you know, like the, that kind of manufacturing, this, the advanced manufacturing is a huge, huge industry of the future, and we're well positioned for it. So, I have rambled for quite a long time. Uh, I'm sure everybody wants to go get some new, some, you know, refresh their drinks and their food. Um, if anyone does have any questions, I'd be happy to take a few questions. We can toss out some t shirts. I see a hand in the back. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Right. I have two questions. Okay. So, first question is I love that you're doing numbers and money matters. Because, of course, you can money. But a lot of times when I share these numbers with other people, they have the sources they're okay, they always challenge that, or they don't believe it. So, when you talk about $450 million of like, this accountability from those big companies like Microsoft, where is the source of data? Is my Sure, sure, sure. Right, that's the first question. Second question is, I moved from Chicago six years ago. It was a different energy in the Middle East startups over there, and I haven't figured the pulse out, and even in the state, I didn't figure out that pulse. Me personally, in the last two years, including a unicorn startup last year, was in Maryland. So I worked for Vivid in the startup last year in Maryland, but I almost don't feel a pulse here, because the last two years, I lived here in NC, but I worked outside. And I didn't hear that from you as the post because I don't know if I'm busy, but in people I talk to that is very common. It's almost like the pulse is missing here. So I want to hear your thoughts. Cool, yeah, thank you for the questions, and I'll uh, see if I can get a shirt all the way back to you there. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> so, um, so to the first question about the source of some of the data, particularly on the economic incentives, uh, that comes from the Department of Commerce in North Carolina. They have an Economic Incentives Committee, I think it's called, EIC. Um, and so you get the data there. A lot of the data I actually pulled from reporting of some other uh, journalistic organizations. I have a written version of a lot of what I've talked about this evening that's going to go out on WRAL TechWire. Uh, I think it might be on Monday. Uh, that'll include all the sources. Um, to, the, to the other question about like kind of what, what what's the pulse of, of kind of startups and the ecosystem and the community? Um, I think it's actually you know something that was healthier a few years ago, and it's. It is, I said at the start of this, I'm not going to talk about the pandemic, but I think it's a little bit of a ripple effect of finally people getting out again and, and convening in person. It's been really, really difficult to maintain the culture fully virtual, to be honest. We made a decision in our own organization, we were running hybrid programs for a, a while, uh, for two reasons. One was obviously it was really important to protect people's health, but also we really believe that by enabling digital participation was a big step in inclusivity of anyone can participate because they don't have to physically be there. Um, we've actually stopped doing hybrid programs because they, they didn't create what you're looking for, which is that real sense of community. Now what we do is we do purely digital things because we still believe in, in some of that inclusivity and some people can't be here, or we do 100% in person. So like tonight's event, we're gonna we're recording here, we'll post it on YouTube later, but we're not we're not live streaming, we're not taking live audience questions from other places um, to try and recapture some of that vibe. But I, th I think there's work to be done. Right here. I think on that note, there's a lot for the startups and obviously the huge companies get asked to come speak and network. What about for those in-between companies? Yeah, that, that, that is a great question because uh, the, the mid-sized companies, I think, are truly like the middle class of industry. And that's what we should target. We should target like this really, really big bell curve of you know the, the, these um, kind of mid-sized companies. There is not in North Carolina. There, there are not a lot of growth accelerators. There are some places around the country that have those kind of dedicated programs. Uh, at Riot, what we have done is we've uh, we've started admitting large companies, sometimes multi-million dollar companies, to actually participate in our startup accelerator and to sit side by side with startups. And we found it has been fantastic helping companies think about like, how do I take my company to the next level? So if you're interested in that, like, you know, obviously that's a little bit of a self-serving response to you, but, uh, but we found that that, that does work. Um, I do really believe that one of the most important things for companies of any size is to get outside of your own walls. Whether that's increasing involvement in conferences and trade shows and kind of industry things to, to really learn kind of where are you relative to your overall landscape and, and where can you partner, where can you, you know, at times M&A and other things can happen to, to help to, to grow. But, but I think just learning best practices, particularly if you're doing something similar to another organization and you're not really in competing places or competing markets, being able to, 
to share that through that kind of interaction can be really, really powerful. But getting into other industries, the way I talk about like kind of the job hopping happens industry to industry, you know, going out, you know, I don't know what industry you're in necessarily, but you know, if you're in say pharmaceuticals, you know, occasionally go into that robotics meetup to see like what are the things there that I should be thinking about in my industry that are just like parallels that you wouldn't think about otherwise. Just kind of getting out there can help. Um, from a like a financial growth capital landscape, I'm probably not the right expert to talk about that in detail. Don't forget our teacher. What's that? Oh yes, of course, of course. <laughs> I'll just hand you so I can. I think my cord will reach. There you go. So All right, my, Steve. my question is as an elected official, I'm Steve Rouse, serve as a senior member of the city council. We do a lot of our technology initiatives. You and I and the town of Morrisville have had a lot of success working on you know leveraging IoT and sensors to do really really great things and. We've been able to do great things with Cary and other cities, but my concern is that, you know, the president last week announced, you know, 82 million broadband. Jim Weaver, the Secretary Weaver, is deploying all this broadband, but there's really no good place for the cities to share the message of the successes they're having. And so, this is a big. I just want to get your observation. I feel like this is a really big problem for the state because we have over 400 cities. I mean, how many how many people here, show of hands, are going to like go to a website to get your information. Everyone gets their information on the devices. So we live in a state where a majority of the cities are getting their information from websites or calling on the phone. It, it's going to hurt. So what are your ideas of how we can support Riot to have, or where, where in the state, whoever the next governor is, whether it's Stein or whoever, what advice do you have to that governor of what they can put in the administration to accelerate these things? I, I think to that question, Steve, and, and for if you couldn't hear, his question was really around kind of at a local and municipal level, you know, how do we uh, adopt these technologies, how do we modernize, how do we do, do things to, to continue to maintain really, really high quality of, of living in our communities and high quality of service to our residents. Um, I think there's both bottom-ups and a top-down approach. So on the top-down, for example, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Virginia again. The funding that I talked about earlier, one of the things that they're working on is establishing cybersecurity guidelines for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. So any quote smart technology or solution that's used in the state will eventually have a set of, of requirements to, to pass. And the industry may say, like, oh, I hate regulation, I help. But the fact is it can standardize and normalize things in a way that then all communities are starting to work in similar ways. There's economies of scale and efficiencies to be gained there. Uh, and they're establishing a data trust. So rather than every single municipality have to think about like, how do I manage my data so that I'm securing it properly, I'm maintaining privacy properly, but I'm also being open with information and data like government should. Um, you know, the state's figuring out ways to do that so that the municipalities and the counties and so on in the state can take advantage of that. So that's kind of a top-down style approach. I think at a bottom-up level, the challenge is that there's massive duplication of effort. Like every single community is working on transportation and traffic, right? Every single community is working on water quality. They're working on stormwater management. They're working on all these things. And rather than every single company just do it over and over and over again when somebody else three miles down the road is also doing it, like finding ways to, to collaborate. And from the bottom up, what that means is that the business owners within the government, the folks that are like, controlling the resources and how they use their time and the budgets and how they spend money. They can take an opportunity to collaborate cross-jurisdictionally on projects, share budgets, which can be very, very efficient, share resources, which can be very efficient. But they have to drive a culture where employees know part of my job is to talk to employees in other places. And that's the missing piece. It's really about workflows and culture. Uh, it's not about willingness. Uh, leaders get together. We actually convene a lot of kind of regional uh, projects around the space. Everybody wants to do it, but the cultural change is a challenge. The time frame, they don't fall through. And you know, there's massive, you know, greenwashing kind of lawsuits and things. Right now, the popular topic is, you know, sustainability. We are gonna do things that enable us to be, you know, positive impact on the climate and so on. That can't be PR. It needs to be authentic. That, you know, that is one of the core reasons that people are so sick and tired of working with big companies and, and are looking for other options. So I think you know, the number one responsibility is just do what you say you're going to do, 
right? Your customers expect that. <laughs> if you tell your customer you're going to deliver something, you don't deliver it, they're going to be upset, right? Um, I think that an awful lot of the onus, though, is on the government to regulate. In our highly politicized world that we're in, and I didn't even talk about the election, right? This is going to be a crazy year uh, that we've got between now and November. But, um, you know, there needs to be regulation of technology. I have all kinds of ideas that will probably be unpopular that I'm happy to share without a microphone if anyone wants to grab a beer later on. But, um, but, but you know, big, big tech in particular is running completely unbridled. I'm a huge tech advocate and enthusiast, but um, yeah, the, the industry is, is at the control of Wall Street. It, you know, all industries are becoming, how do I use Money. How do I use size and strength and power to just make more money, right? What if you, uh, you know, what, what if you grew oranges? And there's so many oranges that you can eat, right? You're not selling oranges. You're not an orange company. You, just, you, you grow them. And you eventually can grow far more oranges than you can eat, but you just kind of keep them to yourself. But over time, you're able to, like, take over another orchard, another orchard. And eventually, you have all of the world's oranges. And you can't eat them. They just sit there, and then they eventually spoil whatever, right? That's what most of capital, big capital, does. It just sits around like a big pile of oranges. It doesn't get used. It's idle capital, right? How much money does Apple have that is just sitting and not doing anything, right? That's the sin that companies have. You should use your money to solve important problems that the world needs solved and to employ people so that everyone is not desperate for what's their next paycheck or can they feed their children or you know, survive a medical mishap. You know? So I, I think the responsibility is to say there are more priorities than money. Nothing wrong with being rich. Everybody here would be happy if you had $5 million, right? But would you need more than $5 million? Like seriously? I don't know.